So in the time I've been allocated, is daylight sunlight working in London? Problems with the British Standard, the RSS guidance note, problems that we're having with professional conduct, issues with the BOE guide, and then at the end it's all been thrown open to debate and discussion. Paul's 25 degree section line first stage like test. No mark. <coughs> Based on some of the criticism that you'll read, some people say that it's a worthless test. But go outside of the M25 like area, start dealing with industrial estates, large setting out of housing estates, etc. For architects working on a like a drawing board master plan like basis a very useful and helpful tool like for them so the issues that we have in the inner m25 central urban areas when we are dealing with this subject and what happens in the wider mass of the country is two very distinct different problems and how the BRE guide is working in some parts of the country is not going to be how it's working in the City of London. And that's the problem in the, the conversation that we are going to have today in this room. That it is a national document. In fact, it could even be argued it's an international document because it's used in the Republic of Ireland as well. So the spread of this like, method is much greater than London. Whilst in 91, the thought process, and I won't put words in his mouth because he's going to be speaking after me, but 91, those of you who are old enough to remember that like, time, we sat behind drawing boards. That was our culture at that time. And therefore, a manual drawing board style method worked in 91 when the first edition came out. That was the culture of the profession. But we know. <laughs> but we are now building computer models. And in a few slides time, I'm going to be talking about the RICS's guidance note. Those of you who are rights of light practitioners will be aware that in the second edition of the RICS guidance note, one of the, the recommendations and professional practice points that was raised in that document was talking about survey accuracy and depending on the survey accuracy within your model that is how brave you can be in terms of a rights of light consultant and that we as practitioners should be telling the people using our reports what is the survey accuracy within the model data that we are using at the moment that is not in the custom when we are doing daylight and sunlight reports. But the more we are using computer like data, and you'll see for those of you who can spot Z mapping type like images, that's an image that's based on Z mapping. If you go into the, the small print when you buy a, a Z map, plus or minus 500 mil is the tolerance accuracy that they will guarantee for the survey data that they are giving you. So when you are carrying that forward, anything that you are working with, you can only guarantee it to a tolerance of plus or minus 500 mil. And you don't know in terms of survey accuracy error, and I'm using that in the, the specific context of how land surveyors use that, that phraseology, so it doesn't mean that your CAD technician has been negligent, it's a technical meaning of the plus or minus tolerance in the calculations because a land surveyor will only ever give you a measurement that is plus or minus something they will never say this is exactly one meter in length 
because depending on how you've measured that one metre depends on the tolerance of its plus or minus. So we've got to get into this vocabulary because we are beyond the point where it's been created by a computer and therefore it's perfect and wonderful and accurate. And at different points in the process, people are using different computer model like data at different points of the design like process and that tolerance, that error can come back to haunt you at a later like date. And the importance of that will come apparent in a few like, slides time. So in the sequence of the documents, why the British Standard first before the RICS guidance then? <coughs> well, for those of you who remember when the debate happened at UCL on the draft British Standard, I was one of the ones who stood up and criticised the draft at that time. So I am being consistent in terms of my criticism, I didn't like it in 2008 and I still don't like it in 2017 for exactly the same reasons. And the problem I have with the British Standard is the lack of numbers. When you go in it, there is one little table and it refers to minimum values. Not maximum, not best practice, not let us aspire to the, the greatness of what our profession can achieve, but what is the minimum standard required for fitness for human habitation. That's how it's expressed in the British standard. And I have a problem with that. Because, as an environmental practitioner, I go to other technical publications that tell me to aspire to greatness. And if you really motivate your client to work to the highest level of environmental and health and well-being design in this country, what are the numbers that they quote for us to aspire to? It is the British Standard numbers that are minimum values. Which raises for me the question, and it was the question that I raised in 2008, and it's the question that I still like hark back, like two. Are these numbers really, in our professional opinion, the minimum standard for fitness for human habitation? Because if they are, if that is what our collective view as a profession is, then some of the decision making should be really simple. If you're building a development and you do not meet that minimum standard for fitness for human habitation, you cannot build it. Why should we be building substandard accommodation? But when you are like me and others sat in this room and you build lots of models and you look at lots of pre-existing built environment data, you see perfectly happy, super prime, and prime properties in the central London area that if we did a calculation on them in their pre-existing context are below that British standard like level. So if a multimillionaire is quite happy to live in it and have it as their primary room, is it really that bad? Or are there other factors that we need to be taken into account when we're looking at this as a point of decision making. And that British standard numbers, they, they appear all over the profession. If you are an environmental health officer and you are going to do an enforcement against a landlord for substandard accommodation, they are the numbers that you would be quoting in your criminal action against the landlord. And again, so I get my BRIAM excellent point if I get that number. I also avoid the bare minimum criminal liability, but if I'm just one margin below it, I'm exposed. Is that what we're really saying? And then when you have a BRE guide that says 
anything that you have in the existing light context, someone can build next door and take 20% of your existing light levels. Well, hang on. You take 20% of my existing light levels and I go below this standard. Am, am I not exposed now to, to liability as a landlord because I've now got substandard accommodation? We need to have this conversation. We need to sort out what our numbers mean. And in the British standard, we don't need just one little table, we need an array of tables. We need the academics in the room to do research and to tell us what is the real minimum standard for fitness for human habitation. Because that will inform all the rest of the conversation. Because once you have, and you know, BOE have lovely things when you go and do their um, eco accreditation type courses, they'll say, This is building regs. Work a little bit harder on your design, and it takes you up to pass standard. Work a little bit harder, good. Work a little bit harder, very good. Well, we should in daylight have variables that tell us how we can push. For clients who want to, this is environmental best standard. This is where we can aim. If we want, by all means, you're not disturbing me if you um, go and sit, sit down. There's no need to stand at the back. Where can we go like, with this slight design? Because at the moment, my feeling with the numbers is that the British standard doesn't do what it says on the tin. It is not setting the standard for our industry. It is a document that is there, that is open to abuse. So they're my points on the British Light Standard. Now, those of you who were there at my rant in 2008, and there's people in the room that suffered like from it, I went round and I bullied them and said, what we need to do is create a, an RICS guidance note on this subject to correct some of the things that have been taken out of the British standard. And one of the big sections that got took out of the, the British standard was its remarks on rights of light. And I argued at that time, we can't, as practitioners, have a, a situation whereby there is no technical expression of how rights of light should be calculated. So RICS, step up to the mark and produce a guidance note. That is now in its second edition. Following that, under the chairmanship as he sat in the room, time to take, take his bow of light glory, Alistair Redler and Dr Peter Defoe was also on the, the working group, this document got produced. Now, it's not aimed at specialist practitioners. It's not meant to replace the BRE guide or the British standard. That's not how RICS sees this type of guidance documentation. It's supposed to be for clients, planning officers, councillors, development surveyors, valuation surveyors, people who are not specialists but need to have a conversation with a specialist, need to commission a rights of light or a daylight sunlight report, understand the difference between the two. That is what this document is aimed at. And that was what was specifically in the mind of the working group when we produced this document. It was not intended or aimed at that moment in time to be a method of regulating practitioners. And when you look in the preamble of the document, it sets the hierarchy of RICS documents. The bottom one is what we call an information paper, and it basically works its way up, and then in our system there is a thing called a practice statement. And historically the practice statements have covered those who, people who are doing valuations, a thing called the Red Book in RICS speak, and if you're doing expert witness work as a chartered surveyor, you're bound by a practice statement there. The great powers in RICS have now decided that the context of all the guidance notes 
when they are redone, the first section of it will become a practice statement. So when next year we start to rewrite daylighting and sunlighting, one of the problems that and Michael's here as well, so there's four of us that are going to have this like task. This is a real issue like four of us. We are going to have to put how to regulate you lot into a list. What is the minimum professional standards that we expect from you? And similarly, when we come to rewrite the rights of light, that's going to be required. And similarly, when we come to rewrite the, the party walls, that's also going to be required. And health and safety has been done, so you can see the, the look and feel of the new like, documents. Which takes us into this. RICS has a different view of the world in terms of how it controls its members. It sees itself as a regulating body. So when you look on a surveyor's note head, you'll see a little strap line at the bottom saying regulated by RICS. And that came about because of the value we're part of our like, profession. So why is this important in terms of daylight and sunlight? People are getting complaints against them. There are people sat in this room, I will not identify them, who have been asked to give expert opinion on other practitioners who are sat in the room because of professional complaints of gross misconduct against them. The public, because of the contentious nature of some large like schemes are really drilling in to the reports that justify an application. So if you're writing a, a daylight sunlight report and you just say, yeah, it's a pass, that will do, you are going to be held to account potentially for why you came to that opinion. And this is when suddenly, what it says in the British Standard, what it says in the BOE Guide, what it says in other like, documents, suddenly take on a whole new meaning. To everyone. Yeah. So the BOE Guide. Are there problems like with it? It's not a one size fit all like solution. Do I want more numbers in there? Yes, I do. Things such as, and when Paul did his like consultation exercise, the environmental impact assessments. You look at other parts of engineering, you will see in EIA technical supporting documents. This is what you how you get your marginal, your all the EIA sort of like definitions. That is not technically expressed either in the British Standard or the BOE Guide. People up, practitioners are having to make it up. And each firm has come to a view and we've put it in. RICS doesn't publish numbers, so we can't put it in our guidance note. SIBC may be able to put it into theirs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where I intend to stop to allow the other speakers their opportunity. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Am I switched on? Can, can you hear me? Yeah? No? Maybe? Um, I've been asked to explain the basis behind uh, the BRE guidance on uh, planning for daylight and sunlight. Um, both our original document, which was uh, developed in 1991, and then it was revised in 2011 to, to give uh, this guidance. And then they, uh, just starting off with the, uh, the key guideline on, on daylight, or the initial one, which is um, based on this 25 degree obstruction angle, which 
Andrew Thompson uh, mentioned. And it's, it's often uh, said that this is predicated on a suburban environment. And predicated is one of those words that appear in daylight um, reports, but not in normal speech. Can I have the next, <laughs> next slide? Um, but it, it actually isn't. Um, the basis behind the 25 degrees is that it's based on the geometry of a typical domestic room. And in the, uh, the British Standard and also in uh, Simpson documents, we have this, this idea of the no skyline and the idea that direct light should be able to penetrate within a room. And if we have a, a fairly high traditional type of window, 2.7 metres above the floor, and, and we have a typical domestic room of 4 metres depth, then daylight will penetrate exa exactly to the back of the room if we've got this 25 degree obstruction angle. If we have a more modern type of uh, window head height, say 2.3 metres, then we'll get 20% uh, of the room at the back which uh, doesn't have um, direct daylight, which again is in line with the, uh, the current British standard. So that's how it's based. It's not really based so much on what's out here and the environment, it's based on the, the geometry of a typical room. It's also similar to the obstruction angle that was generated by the previous document, the predecessor to site layout planning for daylight and sunlight, which was called Sunlight and Daylight Planning Criteria and Design of Buildings. And this was published by the Department of the Environment. And, and that gave, for a wide obstruction opposite, that gave a 25 degree angle. And this was not a suburban design guide. This was uh, a design, that was design guide that was very widely used in cities and town centres at that time. And it also ties in with international guidance. There's uh, a <coughs> wide, widely renowned guide at the time called Housing, Climate and Comfort. And that gave um, angles for, for all sorts of places. And for the latitude of London, for day, good daylighting, it gave a 25 degree angle. If we then um, go on to the next guidance in uh, the BRE guide, which is the, the vertical sky component. Vertical sky component is a measure of the light reaching the window as a proportion of the light on an unobstructed horizontal plane. And if we have our 25 degree obstruction, then that gives us 27% vertical sky component. It's actually 27 and a half, but we, we rounded it down. And so uh, we have this guidance that if the vertical sky component with the new development in place is above 27%, you've still got enough daylight. If it's and then we've got this other guidance, uh, whether it's above 0 0.8 times the existing value. Because clearly you can get situations where the verticals, existing vertical sky component can be quite low. And then what you do you do? And, and this 0 0.8 times the existing value is a bit more of a guess. Because the problem is that if you ask people, if you go ahead and ask them and say, you know, how much daylight would you be willing to lose? They always say none. People are very averse to losing light. So it's very difficult to get a uh, subjective figure on that. And what we did was we, we looked at it in an objective way. And so if you've got a 20% reduction in vertical sky component, that corresponds to a 10 to 15% reduction in the average daylight factor, the daylight inside the room. It's a bit less because of reflected light. And then that corresponds to a roughly, a, uh, depending on how much daylight you have to start off with, it corresponds to a 4 to 7% increase in daytime lighting use. So we've got a measurable effect on people's behaviour and also uh, on their reaction to, to the loss of light. So, so it has a, a sort of objective basis. Vertical sky component is the uh, preferred metric for for new dwellings, because sorry, for existing dwellings, for loss of light to existing dwellings, because it depends only on obstructions. In new dwellings, it's possible for designers to compensate for obstructions by having larger windows and altering room layouts. And here we can use the average daylight factor. 
which is uh, the average illuminance or light level in a space, uh, again, div divided by the outdoor light level. And, and these are the minimum values, which Andrew was talking about, 2% for kitchens, 1.5% for living rooms, 1% for bedrooms. Um, there are actually, there are other, um, so it's, it's, there's a, a few more numbers. There's two more numbers, I suppose, than, than he said. Um, so there's, there's other values for a well daylit space and for one with um, supplementary electric lighting. These values are based on survey work which was done in the post-war building studies, which were carried out immediate, well, just after the war. So they're, so they're ba based on quite old values. Um, there's a new uh, European standard, which is currently under, uh, under consultation, and, and John may, may give you more information about that. And that recommends 2.1% median daylight factor uh, for habitable rooms. I've said in London there, that's, um, that should be in houses. Because um, it's two point... Oh, sorry, it's for the latitude of London. So, yeah, so it is for London. It depends on, on latitude. Um, and this corresponds to uh, 3 to 4% average daylight factor. So higher values. So, so while we're perhaps, I don't know, perhaps later on we might be talking about actually bringing daylight factor daylight factor recommendations down, the rest of Europe is talking about increasing daylight recommendations. And that's partly because, I guess, because of a debate about daylight and health. And it's clear there's been recent findings on uh, the effects of daylight on, on people's health, the uh, modulating circadian rhythms, um, contact with the outside with benefits for health and mood. Um, there's the uh, synthesis of vitamin D, essential for healthy bones. And, um, and also uh, exposure to daylight can actually help uh, prevent short-sightedness in children. And the, the people before us, they've actually um, written on that board, they've written some of, the, some of the other things that might or might not be related to daylight. That's a joke. <laughs> OK, so the, the BRE guidance, um, the BRE advice is not mandatory and uh, it's not supposed to be hard and fast and it gives numerical guidelines which should be interpreted flexibly and the developer or planning authority may wish to use different target values and, and so that's really the topic we're talking about today and it gives some examples and and it says in a historic city centre or an area with modern high-rise buildings, higher degree of obstruction may be unavoidable if new developments are to match the height and proportions of existing buildings. And I'll just um, emphasise that, match the height and proportions, because obviously where, where you can have problems with the guidance is if you want to build something that's a lot bigger and taller than everything else. So uh, some of the examples it gives are in... Um, Appendix F of the guide, which, uh, which is on setting alternative uh, targets. And it gives an example of a muse with obstruction angle 40 degrees. And this is just an example. It just shows you how to do it based on your muse. It's not saying whenever you're in a muse, you can have 40 degrees and you can have a vertical sky component of 18%. <laughs> and also it gives an example of, say, if you've got... Uh, if your existing building is a very tall building close to the boundary and you want to match its height and proportions, then uh, you might want to use it, this mirror image approach to, to generate um, the targets that are involved. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure whether to include this slide because if you're young and impressionable daylight consultants, I don't want to go giving you ideas. And, and also, I definitely don't want people saying, well, Paul Littlefair was a, a daylight group and he said we could do all this. This is how not to do it. This is some of the things which I've... Because um, we get to review quite a lot of uh, people's daylight reports and, and these are some of the things that uh, we've spotted which, which aren't, aren't really 
uh, correct. So, so first of all, one of the things is to say everywhere is dense and urban. Uh, recently, I was doing a uh, reviewing somebody's daylight report for basically what was a field in Reading, and uh, and they um, this wasn't on loss of light to existing buildings because there were no existing buildings nearby. It was uh, on daylight and sunlight to the new development, which was fairly poor. And they said, in a dense urban area, this represents a good um, level of daylight and sunlight. And, and obviously, it was a field. Um, comparing with worst case exemplars, I've noticed that sometimes people um, troll that, I don't know, maybe they're unexperienced or they troll uh, planning decisions and they come up with worst case exemplars. Uh, sometimes over 50 miles away, I was doing a a uh, review of a, a scheme in Brighton, and, and they were comparing it with uh, a worst case, um, a, a quite a, a poor example of uh, daylight provision in uh, a central London borough. Um, this is a bit more uh, sophisticated, this next one, which is um, comparing with Often when you're doing all these daylight analyses, you get lots and lots of results for different heights within the building. And obviously on the upper floors, it's going to be less effective than on the lower floors. And so what people sometimes do is they, they take uh, ground floor exemplars and they say, well, at ground level, you've got this 40 degree angle and, um, and our ground floor results are a bit worse than that. But the upper floor results are much better. And so, uh, so it's all right. But, but that's not really, that's a sort of comparing eggs with oranges type of approach. Going 20% worse, so taking your exemplar uh, development, so, so you've said, well, you know, in this area you could easily have something that's, that's free story and misspacing and you could have perhaps a, a taller obstruction angle, but then saying, well, the BRE guidelines allow us to go 20% worse than that, that's not the case. It, it's so that new development can match the height and proportions of existing buildings, not be 20% higher. Um, hiding the real data, and, and sometimes what happens is that people compare a scheme with, uh, say, a consented scheme or with what they think a, an exemplar VSC would, would be, and they never actually state what the what the actual baseline is. And so it's very difficult for planning officials to work out what the actual impact on people, who of course have never experienced a consented scheme or an exemplar scheme, they've, they've just experienced the existing situation, what the impact on those people is going to be. And the other thing, the, fi the final thing, and here I, here I have a lot of sympathy for daylight consultants because this is a really difficult thing to do and it's a really difficult thing for planners to do. The final thing is to ignore cumulative effects. And, and in parts of London, we're sitting on a, a cumulative time bomb because what's happening is that you get a situation where um, you have not perhaps an existing, existing building and then somebody's building a very tall building nearby and they're really maximising their, their, their site and they're building quite tall and close by, but they're still getting lots of light around the side of it. And, and they're saying, well, you know, these people have still got one and a half percent average daylight factor, or they've still got a reasonable vertical sky component, so, so our building is all right. But then, of course, the next door people, they, they see what's happened on that site, and they want to build something the same height. And maybe the people on the other side, they want to build something the same height. And these people who are already down at 1.5 percent average daylight factor, they've got nowhere to go except sub substandard daylight. So, so, that's, uh, so that's an issue. So I suppose in conclusion, as day daylight consultants, um, inclusion, it's, um, daylight experts are, are great at calculating daylight. But in these important decisions about whether to sacrifice daylight and sunlight for increased density, it's only fair to let local people, the planners, decide. And it's down to us to, to give them the data that they need to give a clear and accurate assessment 
of the daylight impact of new development. Thank you. I'm going to start with this because uh, this gutting like unlocking London's residential density is actually, I believe, the reason why we started a conversation. Um, this is a publication that actually comes out of a two year period of research. And the research that was carried out started coming from a data consultancy company um, trying to get to grips with. Um, how come that every time that you assess anything uh, in a denser urban environment, you never seem to match the numbers you ought to? And as such, you need to try and find justifications as to why you think it's still okay for someone not to get the minimum ADF or to have VSCs which are less than ideal. Um, then it actually very quickly became a much wider conversation. Um, we work with a lot of different people, um, including planning consultants, uh, local authorities, developers, um, daylight reviewers, um, planning QCs. And the point was that if we were going to try and understand how daylight relates to the urban environment, we have to try and look into all of the other subjects that actually make up what the urban environment is and the way we experience it. So in my view, to try and uh, get some <coughs> clarity about how we go about daylight and sunlight in the city, um, we actually need to ask ourselves a lot more questions than just what is the minimum numbers that we should choose, um, which is not an easy task at all. But what I want to remind everyone is that the publication that was actually attached to the invite tries to address the question of urban density in London. It therefore discusses other matters apart from just daylight levels. It tries to look at the different experience you get in the city of London in particular, but other cities which are much denser than more rural settings. So urban grain, building typologies, and the role that amenity plays in creating the place we like to be in is to me what we should be interrogating. So in this context, daylight levels, in my view, form part of the wider amenity concept. And what is amenity? Amenity is actually defined as the pleasantness, the character and the quality of the built environment you live in. And this is key in my view. So daylight levels are actually defined by the urban grain and the buildings that belong to that urban grain. And the opposite is also true, that varying daylight and sunlight levels define those very different settings that we call urban grain or areas of London. And the variety of it all is what attracts us to London. So I'm just gonna show you a few pictures of what I'm talking about. So this is an area of Islington, and as you can see, it actually includes <coughs> buildings of different type, and sometimes they're just opposed in different ways. But in this part of London, as you can see, there is a lot of terrace housing, for instance, which is part of what London is. This is Covent Garden, on the other hand, and it is a completely different urban environment. Now, you don't have to really ask yourself whether you like one more than the other, you may like one more than the other at a different stage of your life. The point here is that the two completely different environments are still London. This could be kind of a hybrid of the two. This is the emerging London. And if you actually do uh, you know, a, a job related uh, to the construction industry or uh, the design industry, you realize that uh, more and more of London looks like this. This is actually one example of many schemes that are emerging and are being built at the moment, which result from the adoption and the application and the interpretation of the current guidance, actually the guidance uh, you know, that has been going for the last 10, 15 years, not just the daylight and sunlight, but all types of guidance. 
this is potentially the best example I could find of a high density but low rise environment in London. It's Malibon and it is a mixed use part of London as well. Again, another part of London that a lot of people love. So if you were to ask yourself, and I think Andrew pointed this out right at the beginning, why are all of these different environments with all of the different buildings, with all of the different uses and the different <coughs> type of people that live in it, trying to adhere to the same number is the question that I want to ask everyone because we find it incredibly hard to justify it in that way. To give you more examples, so Muse houses, you know, beyond what they were meant to do historically, today they'll be empty if someone didn't love living in there. The same goes for mansion blocks. This is kind of the normal block of a hundred years ago. It's actually quite a big revival of mansion blocks nowadays because they are seen as you know, buildings that actually deliver quite good level of daylight after all. But just so that you're aware, they don't achieve nowhere near the 25 degree or 27 VSC levels. And this is just an example of a contemporary block um, in London. So the background to all of this, uh, which needs to be understood, is not necessarily only one of health and well-being, which is incredibly important and incredibly complex to uh, arrive at. What are the key ingredients and how much of any ingredients you need to actually be healthy or happy? But in terms of trying to deliver housing and looking at the future of London, we need to develop <coughs> have more houses and there are certain things that need to be appreciated so for instance the fact that London in itself we call it a very dense city but there are many ways of defining density in terms of land use London is by no means a dense city it is actually a city that offers a lot of land in a city centre let alone the suburbs and let's not even start beyond the M25 but what the white paper, for instance, started looking into is how this land is used. And it's actually calling for making better use of it, whatever that actually then translates to in reality. The other thing that it actually points out is that when people are asked to picture high density <coughs> developments, they immediately think of something really dark, really dingy, or really tall. But effectively, if you think about Malibone or Chelsea, etc., London offers the opposite. It actually offers vast areas which achieve a much greater than average density in terms of land use, in terms of population. Um, and that's the actual prime of London in many, many different ways. The other document that is incredibly relevant is how the GLA, the London Plan, um, it's looking at amongst many other things, what are the policies that should be put in place to allow for London to grow and to try and do it in the best way possible. So this was published in 2016 and it actually includes something about daylight because it didn't used to before, surprisingly enough. But what it actually does, it tries to bridge um, the gap between uh, what the BRE guidance actually started, which is the whole concept of when you want to try and apply what's in this book flexibly, it actually means that you need to understand the context you are applying it into, much like the example of the muse that you were giving before. A muse could work at 40 degree angle, another could actually be 45 or, or 25. It is not a one size fits all and that's not how it should be interpreted, yet that is how it is implemented. So. This sentence is, to me, quite a step change and it actually opens up the opportunity today to go out in London, find those areas that people love, study them, learn from them and understand why people like them. And daylight is obviously one of the metrics that can be studied. And by this I don't mean we should pick between VSC or ADF or UDIs or... It, it is not a matter of selecting which is the best scale. It's a matter of understanding how do we go and study things and what is the approach we want to take 
to learn from what's around us. So, this is the daylight group, nonetheless. So how do we go about it in practice? And I just wanted to show you a few examples of how we are trying to go about this problem of learning from what's around us. So this is a, three, well, a very small part of a very large 3D model of London that we're building. At the moment, we have about 280 square kilometers of it. And by in 12 months' time, we will have covered the whole of the M25 ring. So at that point, we will actually have pretty much all we need to work within the M25 and the ability to study if we wanted to. So this is an example of every facade which lacks the detail, and that it is caveat in our reports, you know, but the accuracy of the buildings is 15 centimeters, and so the distances between buildings is correct. Um, and you can start to look at very large data to suggest what are the numbers that go hand in hand with certain urban grains, for instance, as a means to understand <coughs> how light defines the urban grain and the reverse. You can then take all of those dots, which are single VSC levels, for instance, and bring them back into a tool that allows you to l interrogate the information. So here is just a screenshot of a GIS map we developed, whereby you can then group all of those facade details, and you can start studying the average at several floor heights, ground first, second, for instance, you know, block by block, or by postcode, or by <coughs> wards, or, or you decide. There is even a tool that allows you to just draw an area and understand what the numbers are. You can do the same with sunlight. And the interesting thing when you actually step back from the individual window, but you try and look at the city as a whole, is that you realize that over London, that variety of spaces and grain have completely different rhythms of daylight and sunlight that accompany the architecture and the local character. So it is completely unsurprising probably to understand that in a, in a dense environment like this, the streets play a role, the public areas play a role, the courtyard play a role, and they all play a role within the amenity of the place, but always a very different one, which we're still interrogating though with the same metric, same threshold every time. And here I wanted to give you actually a proper worked out example of the direction that we are taking, you know, at GIA. Um, this is actually one example of a number of study areas um, that we are now putting forward together with um, the proposed scheme when this is uh, um, appropriate. And it doesn't actually venture 50 miles out and it actually states all of the assumptions made and it tries to work out the area, not the proposal alone, before you then go into the detail of the single unit that is impacted. So this is 10 Broadway and a picture of what it actually looks like. It actually is partly here and partly there, but there is also extra consented scheme in the area that you can add we have defined which areas are in conservation, which are not, and how the two um, face each other. And most importantly, when we do the studies, we do not take only the impacts around uh, you know, the proposed, but we actually take a large enough area to represent the character of that piece of London. You can obviously interrogate it with the VSC scale which you can break down in various ways. So you can look at uh, the distribution on ground floor, first floor, second floor, whether there is a commercial versus domestic uh, user ground floor that justifies comparing that side to the other side. I mean, these data are available on the London, London data store if you go and find that it's all open source. We can interrogate the actual footprint on the site, so the land use, the distribution of heights of buildings. And when you start taking these elements, this is the total overshadowing, the actual face-to-face -face -face distances. Why are we fixated with 18 meters face-to-face? -face? It's so unrepresentative of the majority of what people love in London. It's beyond me, but 
there you go, you can actually take all the streets and measure them and understand what are the actual averages. And once you start doing this with, all, with your side and all of the other side that are representative, actually a picture emerges which can easily be discussed with the local authority which in the schemes that we have done actually took part in the process and was willing to suggest schemes that they aspire to reproduce because they are the best that has come forward in the borough. So you can start comparing what is deemed to be the best and not just the worst. And the most important thing is that we always go back to the things that we experience. No one understands what a 27 VSC is if you don't relate it back to something you have experienced. No one exactly knows what 1.5% ADF feels like. It's a completely varying scale. And, but what we all understand is I can walk down the street or that street or the other street. I can experience the space. I can actually be inside building and, and have a say for myself. So it's very important that we always relate the data back to the real world. So now here I'm doing a little jump that takes me back to what I was saying uh, at the beginning. Daylight, the way we are interpreting it, is part of the wider amenity that people enjoy. Is one aspect, and actually these are not my words, but they are polls in the guidance. Uh, you know, it, that's obvious to everyone, but sometimes we just like to put th things in different silos because we can actually grasp them better, but that's not how the real world actually works. <coughs> and when it comes to understanding daylight and sunlight, we need to be able to put it back into some kind of context. So if you take open space, not amenity space, open space, which seems to nowadays translate to green spaces, but it isn't. Amenities are a whole ensemble of things that we love. But if you take open space, I wonder why a park is actually treated similarly to a street if we were you know, to assess it using the usual metrics. But then in planning, sometimes it isn't, right? They cover different roles. There is a need for one and the other. Why is one more of an amenity than the other? So isn't there like a way that we can put this together? Because if you did a very simple analysis, for instance, and this is more like a, a cheeky joke than anything else, but a park, we all are aware, it's beautiful, and in London, it's th they are absolute assets. But this is the weather that we have 80% of the time, maybe 90. <laughs> so very hard to make use of all of that space. Canopy Street, this is the difference. You either wear a t-shirt or you wear a raincoat. So there could be other ways of interrogating the use of spaces. But in reality, this is what I was trying to say. This is what we perceive as making up a place. And to try and find a way to put these together including Bellar and Sanad, in my mind, would end up producing more meaningful policies if we want to keep on developing and inhabiting the city. So uh, I'm going to conclude with this slide. Um, if I were to ask all of you guys uh, what a suburban area feels like or what a city centre feels like, I bet that you will all respond more or less similar. You would have in your head a picture of all of that complexity before already worked out because you've experienced it, right? You would know that if you go a little bit outside, you would have plenty of light, you would have plenty of fields, you would have probably plenty of schools for children. You know, if you are in the city center, you're struggling for the very opposite, but maybe that's what you want or that's what you like. Point being, I believe that the beauty of London is that it is all three and all of grey in between. That's what is what, what makes London an interesting place. And the, the actual concept is represented by a pie chart because that's probably the only analogy that I could find that <coughs> kind of suits. You know, it is, if you are trying to develop a new area and you're trying to mix the same ingredients in the same way you are very likely to bake the same cake. Hence the Elephant Park scheme and all of the new regenerations would tend to look very similar. But if, on the other hand, you envision the space you want to create, the place you want to obtain, and then you study what defines it, you may be able to define 
what proportion needs to go into to create a different cake each time. So to sum it up, if it is true that varying daylight and sunlight levels define the character of different urban environments, to deliver variety in our urban environment, we must first envision what we want to create. And then we can go out and study the levels of light which help define it. Thank you. Would everybody like to stand up? Come on, you can do it. My name's John Walker, I'm the director of Planet Westminster. I've worked there for 33 years, and we get more claims, more objections on daylight and sunlight than probably all the other local authorities of the country put together. I remember doing an appeal on uh, a scheme on daylight and sunlight where this flat had no windows whatsoever. And to enter the flat, you had to go through a gap between two garages that were occupied by prostitutes every evening. And I remember when the inspector came to view the property uh, and the guy was trying to argue that it's perfectly acceptable to have a residential flat without any windows whatsoever. He said, it's really good because if I had windows, I would see the girls in action uh, on the way into the flat. Uh, needless to say, he lost the appeal. You can sit down now, because I just thought you might want to stretch your legs. And at least at the end of this, you'll say, well, he's the guy that made us stand up before he did his presentation. Do you want to flick the... Oh, I put the... Yeah. Right. Um, I've been asked to talk about the BRE guidelines, because the accusation is, you negative planner people, you're, you're stopping growth, you're stopping for things going up, because you're, you're um, taking too much a literal interpretation of the BRE guide, and you're stopping everything from happening. And I'm here to say that's not the case. So, um, the first thing on the guidance, I th have I missed one? Yes. Is, it is advisory. Paul has told us that already. It is not policy. Paul has told us that already. The guidance is all about achieving good daylighting and sunlight. Not about minimum, because a lot of people interpret that that's a minimum standard of 27%. That's about getting good levels of daylight and sunlight. And it acknowledges that in a historic city such as Westminster, uh, you may have no option but to go higher and breach what's in the guidance for good times, timescape uh, reasons. Uh, and I'm here to say it's not rocket science. Believe you me, at the end of this presentation, you'll realise this is not rocket science. From a planner's point of view, it is pretty much horses for courses, which I hope you'll understand by that by the end of this presentation. It's about striking a balance. Daylight and sunlight is just one ingredient amongst hundreds of ingredients a planner has to take into account when assessing an application. What are the considerations? What are the planning benefits? And what benefits are there that a scheme delivers against that harm and the loss of daylight and sunlight to somebody's or lots of people's windows are some of that harm that we have to balance out. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the Westminster way of doing it, uh, because quite often other boroughs come to us and say, how do you do it? And we say, well, it's all about being pragmatic. That's all it's about. Forget about the science, let's be pragmatic. So we strike a balance. It is extremely rare for an application for a large scheme to be refused on daylight and sunlight grounds in the West End of London, notwithstanding everybody's cheek by jowl and we have lots and lots of residents in Westminster, quarter of a million restaurant, uh, res residents in Westminster. In the city of London, they don't really have that problem because they, they don't like residents, they don't encourage them, and I don't blame them. Uh, and sunlight and daylight is just one consideration. Often, the height of a building is governed by the heritage issues because there is a statutory obligation if a building is listed or conservation area that we cannot ignore. There's no statutory obligation that says it's 27% VSC, therefore the IMR cannot go down if it's more than 20%. And size does matter when assessing applications and the harm to people's windows. And I'm sorry, the big dog gets more than the little dog. The message I'm getting is that if it's just a domestic window that's affected against another domestic property, uh, we're going to raise our standards, whereas the big developer, 
because they're bringing a lot of other benefits in a regeneration scheme, they are going to get waived more. So it's not fair for him, he gets more. You will understand as I go through. Size matters in terms of your interpretation and how you use the guidance. So let's start with householders. Let's start down the lower level. There is a higher expectation that you would use the BRE guidance um, a little bit more rigorously on a domestic uh, property. Why? Because there's a neighbour against a uh, neighbour. There aren't lots and lots of benefits because Mr Johnson's going to get his fourth bedroom extension to his house against uh, Mrs Smith's window, which is going to be going to lose some daylight. So if it's a single issue from a planning perspective, it's more likely that we will expect the applicant to be more respective of the BRE guidance. And we would say, well, if it's more than 20% uh, um, uh, reduction, there may well be a problem. Um, the simple rules, you've got to balance the needs of one resident against the other. So if the light being lost is to a bed sit, we will give that more protection. It's the only room you've got to live in. You've got to, you sleep in it, you eat in it, you make love in it. It's very, very important for you. Whereas if it's the fourth bedroom to a house that's been affected, we are going to be a little bit more lenient because there's other rooms that you can go into the property. But is it a living room? Is it a non-habitable room? Is it a staircase? How deep is that room? So, for example, if this little resident here objected to something because her 240th bedroom is affected, we might say, Queenie Poo, you've got another 239 rooms to go. So I think that gets the message through. Householder applications, uh, we take into fact if there's a bad neighbour window, if the window's on the boundary, you get people that punch windows on their permanent development rights and party walls, etc. We'll say, well, you shouldn't have really done that in the first place. So don't expect us to go to the upper echelons of protecting it in terms of 27% VSC. We will factor that in. And we'll factor in that if you've got more than one window on the room, we factor that in that we are going to allow lower standards because you know, you've got more than one window. It's not rocket science. And also, um, it's, a, it's a calculation, but if you've got loads and loads of glazing on your, your flat, uh, we are going to be more relaxed than somebody who's only got a very, very small window and that's their only uh, uh, inlet from an amenity point of view. Size does matter. We'll look at how a room is used, if you've got a neighbour dispute, um, uh, which are the working areas that they use, where is it important to get the light um, against other parts of the room. So we analyse the room if we get down to a neighbour dispute. And the biggest mistake planning officers do and local authorities is they stand at the window and take a photograph out the window and then they show that to the committee and say, oh my God, it looks terrible. You can't see any sky, there's very little left. That's not the working plane. You take your photograph that 0.85 of a metre because that's where you want the light uh, to be. That's where you're going to use the available light. Paul will tell you that. Paul's already covered balconies. If we've got balconies, we will accept lower standards. We'll factor in the fact that um, if you benefit from balconies, that is going to have an impact on the light in that room. Um, and it gets political. Uh, members are all more likely, councillors in making decisions, they're going to protect the little old resident against the resident. So even where there isn't really an impact in daylight and sunlight because you can still see the sky, they'll use the good old sense of enclosure refusal to turf out the application. So let's get on the big stuff now. These are the big schemes that we're all saying no to and London can't grow because we're using the BRE guidance to say no. The key message is the bigger the scheme, the bigger the regeneration benefits, the less weight that will be given to daylight and sunlight. And handling me major regeneration schemes in Westminster, and we get a lot, and some of them have been showcased, such as New Scotland Yard in the previous presentation. Yes, we take light, lots of light seriously. Um, if we don't, we're going to get a judicial review. If we don't, somebody's going to quote the Human Rights Act at us. So we make the consultants work very, very hard to demonstrate that the loss of light light is really needed to deliver that development. It keeps all the daylight consultants in a job. What do we look at? What's the impact? How many windows are affected? What are the windows? What's behind that windows that are affected? And what are the mitigating circumstances that might say we're going to be a little bit more lenient here. We also say, if there are really serious losses of light, we'll say, listen, do us an exercise. What would a BRE compliance scheme look like with a 20% reduction? And what are the implications for the scheme? It's a useful way 
of looking at it that if you did it, the scheme's dead because you lose too many flows and it, it's not viable for the scheme. But we do it to demonstrate that you just can't apply it in a situation because too much is going to be lost. But sometimes small changes can actually bring big benefits to some of the residents' windows. So let me give you a typical Westminster example. Uh, 110 Marlborough High Street, a typical development that is surrounded on all sides by good old residents in their windows who are desperately trying to hang on to their daylight and sunlight. I'm going to lose it all if this development happens. This went to committee last night, so you can tell I did my presentation this morning. Um, they, they looked at a scheme for extra stories over here and growing the uh, building in the middle, all surrounded by uh, residents, and this is what the report said. So Bourne House is just one example that's affected. Um, you've got the existing VSC on the left-hand side, the proposed VSC, and what the ratio is. There isn't a single window on that list that complies with the 20% reduction. In fact, the worst one is 59% reduction to somebody's bedroom. Uh, that person's going to be left with a 2% vertical sky component. That's a lot, lot lower than 27%. Yet yeah, planning permission was granted last night. It would be remiss for me not to touch on rights of light and ambulance chasers. There are people that acquire, they buy buildings next to due regeneration sites uh, in order to get the compensation through rights of light. So there are ambulance chasers, they're there, they've worked out, oh, look, look at all the windows on this, we will benefit from each window in terms of rights to light claims. It is happening a lot these days. There's money to be made out of rights to light. Um, it was 237, but uh, more and more authorities now realise they might have to start using 203 in order to remove those injunctable rights. And I think that's a, a bigger issue at the moment. Lots of stuff that we say are fine. The developer comes back three months later and says, sorry, John, we're going to have to make a smaller injunctable rights to light. So the question is, do we need new guidance? Do we need to have a new minimum standard? I say beware. Beware setting lower standards. Because the risk is that will become the default standard. If you say, well, come on, 27% of the rest of the country, let's make it 15% for London. Political decision makers will say, oh, well, we've got a lower standard for London now. So anything below 15 is obviously now going to be totally unacceptable. Make it 10%. Anything below 10%, then it's going to be wholly unacceptable in the eyes of politicians because we've lowered the standard. We've, we've got the standard now for London. Let's not have anything less than that. So there's a massive risk that if you actually set a, um, a lower standard and say that's the standard for London, that local authorities and planners will pull back and say, that's great, that's what we're sticking to because the standard's been put to that. Thou shalt not pass below that line. And you saw the example that I showed you before of 2%. That's not unusual in the West End. In fact, we grant schemes that are even less than 2% VSC, less than 1%. So what do we need? I put it to you, we might need more training. Uh, there is a lack of training a lot of planning authorities. I know this because lots of other authorities said, we've got this problem with daylight and sunlight. How do you do it in Westminster? Because we don't know. Um, I don't think the planning schools do enough to teach the science of daylight and sunlight. We get a lot of graduates and they come in and they know absolutely nothing about it. To my mind, it's scandalous because if anybody's going to be in old fashioned money development control officers, they need to know about it and the planning skills are fearless on it. Uh, there's a lack of awareness and also that's officers and some of the members as well need to understand it as well. So I put it to you that there needs to be more training because w when local authorities are refusing things, just using literally what the guidance says, uh, they are wrong. So, we could do with some fine tuning, I would suggest. It's easier, rather than reinvent the wheel and set new standards, to actually use the national policy planning framework, which is the government's advice, to actually push people in the right direction. It should be saying, listen, planning is all about all these different variables and balancing it, and you don't just say, well, let's just pick out sunlight and daylight, and, and if you feel that, it's gone, uh, it needs to remind planners that if there are other regeneration benefits, this delivers 150 new flats, therefore Mrs. Smith's loss of light, which is going to go down to 2%, sorry, that, that weighs more heavily the uh, increase in the number of residential units that we need for the area. 
making it clear to higher density areas there needs to be that flexibility, which Westminster does. Uh, and it just doesn't have to be for housing as well. I mean, the, um, an office block should not be debarred just because there's a loss of daylight and sunlight to uh, residential properties um, as well. So we need to remind the planning system about there are other benefits and daylight and sunlight is just one consideration. So my conclusions, uh, the, the existing BRE guide works in the West End of London if it is used properly. Uh, there's a lack of understanding and lack of training in a lot of other uh, areas. The risk of setting new lower standards that could become the bottom line would be a problem and would stop an awful lot of development in Westminster and the City of London. Stronger uh, national guidance is the quick fix. And I think in John Twill Rights of Light is a bigger issue in my experience and something needs to be done about that. And that's my lot. Thank you very much for listening. This is about new approaches. It's not about any particular measure as being acceptable or so forth. It's just about different ways of looking at it. Uh, partly theoretical, but also one of them actually did get used in the real world and in quite a, a striking way. Um, so, just to go on, an aperture. It can be in a recess, it can have something around it, and it can be in a dense urban environment. Anywhere, an aperture can be anywhere and we want some performance measure for the aperture. So, there can be a sunlight, some measure of sunlight availability, some measure of skylight availability, or maybe a climate-based measure. And we'll first look at the climate-free ones. Okay, so we're not looking at occurrence of, of sunlight or how bright the skies may be or so forth. Okay, and the first measure we'll look at is the sunlight beam index. I'll just leave you to read that for a moment. Okay, so it's to account for an awful lot of the points which were raised in the previous presentations. You know, how often sunlight may occur due to the, just the geometry, but also include the size of the aperture. And the units are very simple. If you have sunlight on a one meter square aperture and it's normal for one hour, you will have one meter squared hours of sunlight beam. So that's the amount, it's the cross-sectional area of sunlight that will pass through the aperture. As soon as the aperture moves, soon, sorry, as soon as the sun moves away from the normal, then you'll have shading around the edge. So you'll have self-shading of the structure, but then you also have reduced cross-sectional area passing through of beam. And that'll become, I think, quite simple to see if we look at this example of a one meter square aperture set in a thin wall and set in a 20 centimeter deep reveal and you run the simulations for the sunlight beam index. Now, this is a vertical aperture in London with all of these different orientations. And let's just look at south first. So if there's one meter square for the whole year, this is a measure of the total cross-sectional area of sunlight that could pass through that aperture. Yeah, it's a single number, doesn't depend on anything else. Um, <clears throat> if we include the 20 centimeter reveal, that drops down right down to 1,340. It's very sensitive to the orientation of the aperture. <clears throat> now that's a single bottom line number. Yeah, it's a measure of cross-sectional area of beam <coughs> that, can end, that can pass through the aperture. If we now look at the temporal dimension of this, because we've got this as well, there's that number again, 1,927, south facing, we can look at where this is happening throughout the whole year. So this thin line here is December the 31st, and these, at least, this little thin wedge there is at 15 minute time steps. Yeah. So you've got 24 hours, 365 days, and of course the highest values are in winter when the sun is low and shining into that space. <coughs> Move that around 45 degrees, we get a different total, actually not too different, but we see the change in that, of course, it's happening more later in the day, as we'd expect when it's now got a, a southwest <coughs> orientation. But it gets a lot more interesting when we look at a dwelling with lots of windows. 
So we've got a residential dwelling with a sunroom, we've got all these window groups, and we do all of this for all of those apertures in whatever context there is in that space. There was, there was some, I think, in the houses dotted around. And then we can sum all of those and we get a single number for the whole dwelling. 24,520 metres squared hours, a sunlight beam index for that entire dwelling. That's the total amount of glazing, 25 and a half metres. If we divide that by that, we end up with this kind of <coughs> normalised value, which gives us a measure of the efficiency of all that glass of getting sunlight into that space. And we can easily just take away, subtract a sunroom and see how this will change and see how the bottom line numbers change. But the, the temporal dimension gets interesting and perhaps it's more digestible that instead of looking at it like this, we look at it like that. So now we've got monthly AM and PM totals. That's that same dwelling there. So we can see for this one, you know, it's there in PM in summer, we're getting the highest values there. But when we look at the sunlight beam index, when we rotate this dwelling around, the whole compass at 45 de degree increments, we can see how this dwelling is performing there. So clearly with that aspect, most of the sunlight will be coming in in the morning, just as we'd expect, not much there. The highest total overall is for this one, but it's quite evenly spread. Maybe we're concerned about overheating in summer. So it's the summer values in, in the PM, and there we've got the highest one. So even though that total overall is quite a bit less than this one, it's concentrated a lot in those PM summer months. You've got something that's very powerful, can communicate an awful lot of information in a very simple way. Now that's the sunlight part. The skylight part now, um, it's a similar concept, it's even simpler. Of course it came later, the simpler things always do come later. So this is a measure of the connectedness now to a uniform sky. Not the CI overcast, and I think there are lots of good reasons why it shouldn't be a CI over overcast. And in fact, I think everything, the daylight factor included and the vertical sky component would be a lot better if it was just using a uniform sky. The CIE overcast sky is an extreme type of sky. It doesn't actually happen very often. I have the total occurrence of cloudy skies and so forth. Um, sunlight beam had a natural number come out of it in the sort of thousands for an un unobstructed um, aperture. There was no need to do any normalization, but you do need that for this because there is no sort of natural number that pops out. It depends on the brightness of the sky. So this uniform sky, so why don't we just choose a number that's comparable to the numbers that you get for the sunlight beam index and up to a thousand, two thousand. So w there you're getting two thousand lux with a horizon when that one meter square is horizontal and seeing the whole hemisphere. When it's seeing half the hemisphere there, you know, it's vertical, you're getting one thousand lux. And so for one meter square of that, you're getting one thousand lumens there, two thousand there. And so this quantity depends on that orientation uh, to the zenith, but not to the altitude. Yeah, sorry, the azimuth. Yeah, it's all the same around. So, similar example, one meter square and a thin wall, one meter, uh, and we're getting 1,000. That's our skylight index for that. Add a 20 centimeter reveal, and that drops down to just below 700. Put an overhang on there, drops down further, and stick something around the side, further still. So this is for anywhere. It doesn't matter where the location is. Because yeah. that uniform sky is the same everywhere. When it's the sunlight part, it depends where the location is and what the orientation is. Now you can put these together, so this is what we've just seen, and that's anywhere, and then the corresponding sunlight beam index for two orientations, south and uh, southwest, and the place is Rome, I think. Yeah, yeah, Rome there. Um, so it's those two numbers that tell you about the sunlight and skylight connectedness of the aperture, regardless of how much is around it. Um, techniques like this, because they're purely geometry, 
are completely scalable, at least they should be, depending on which calculation tool you're using. So uh, I dropped that little residential house in the middle of Manhattan and just to check that it worked, and it all does. Now, uh, climate-based climate measures for sunlight and skylight. So um, this was probably the first 3D city model that was a radiation map using what's now called climate-based modelling. So that was back in 2000, and this was a model of San Francisco. Didn't quite translate well from VRML, a few polygons missing and so forth. Total energy would look very similar if it was total illumination. Uh, here's somewhere I think that's probably recognisable. That was done in about 2003. Uh, didn't do anything with that other than I think it appeared in an exhibition of modern art somewhere in Copenhagen. Uh, this is the, the case study. So this will be the tallest uh, residential tower I think in the world when it's finished in 2019. Uh, it's no longer called the Nordstrom Tower, its name has changed several times, it's now called Central Park Tower. And the legal agreement for, this, for the development of the tower includes a measure of injury to an, an adjacent property um, predicted using CBDM. And this, this began in 2005. <laughs> um, so the adjacent space is the Historic Arts Student League. And this, this building, 1875, every great American artist has been associated with the building one way or another. And what the users of the building were concerned about was the, the natural light to the daylit studios on the top floor. So the 2005 proposal was pretty much just a big block. Now, it wasn't a detailed model, but it was enough for them to get worried about <laughs> the impact on the skylights. Yep. Um, so they were offered the daylight factor, and they said, what's that? And it was explained to them what it was, and it was thought, it's a bit of an abstraction, you know, this, it's not cloudy all the time, and so forth. Um, so they weren't convinced by this. This was the users of the building, yeah, the artists. Uh, they were offered shadow patterns. They said, that's a waste of time. They're largely north-facing roof lights, and so forth. And just by a total quirk, somebody in New York who was advising the, the users of the building was familiar with, with, with my stuff and, and climate-based and said, could we use that? I said, yes, I'm sure we can. And explain it like this. Um, you can take a light meter with you when you go and see them and say, here's a measure of light and illumination. The simulations are equivalent to putting that light meter on the glazing, leaving it there for a whole year, totting up the hourly values using sun and sky conditions predicted using New York climate data, and then doing the same thing with the building in place. And they said, yes, that's what we want. Now, they, um, they discussed with the developers that there was potential for amelioration of the reduction by including the reflectance, component of reflectance. So we did the simulations with a black tower and with 50% reflectance, used a very detailed model um, of the surroundings. Uh, just look at that number. That's the... Uh, lux hours, cumulative total sun and sky, area weighted <laughs> for those two skylights. Um, there it is with the black tower, there it is 50%. And those are the numbers. So it dropped by about a third with the black tower, but then you could almost halve that drop by having a 50% reflectance for a, a reasonable height close to the windows. And they said, that's what we want. And in terms of the agreement, they said, when the final design is, is decided upon, it needs to be evaluated using the same technique to show that it was no worse than what they'd agreed on. Now, they agreed some financial compensation. I was not party to any of that, but I imagine it was quite substantial. Um, and then, of course, there was the crash in 2008. Everything got put on hold for a while, especially a sort of large pro project like this. And when it came back in 2013, it caused an awful lot of fuss because not only was it big, but it was going to be very big and it was going to be cantilevered over the Art Student lead, League building. And it was that in particular, I think, that really sort of riled a lot of people. Um, so that's what it looks like in profile. Um, now, in the design, this, this whole elevation um, doesn't have any windows in it. It's just going to have a zinc oxide, I think it's a zinc oxide, finish, um, which hopefully will, will weather well and keep its high reflectance. So it is actually very close to 50%, the material they, they decide upon. Um, but in the, 
in the news in, in New York, in the architectural press, this, this cantilever was seen as a giant's foot, sort of squashing the building, uh, the Art Student League, and, there was, um, and they thought they should, uh, they should protest against this and so forth. There was another big wadge of money got offered and so forth. But the key thing is that actually the effect of the cantilever was minimal because whilst it's a very tall tower, it's actually a very skinny one. And so the, the overall reduction was actually no worse than what had been agreed to already. So um, th I think that is the only instance anywhere in the world where climate-based art modelling has been used <laughs> in any form of agreement. And yet yeah, it's a sort of one that will be difficult to ignore, especially when the building's finished. So um, we've got climate-free, climate-based, and everything else to talk about um, after the break. I can there's loads of papers on this that are freely available if anybody wants them and uh, some acknowledgements there. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, John.